A Maybach luxury limousine, the world's most expensive series-produced car. Frankfurt Airport on a Thursday evening shortly before 10. The deluxe model will shortly go aboard the LH8400, a freighter jet scheduled to embark on a round-the-world cargo flight in two hours' time. We will accompany the freighter on its global odyssey, seven stopovers on four continents, and all that in the space of less than three days. The aircraft must be back in Frankfurt in 66 hours' time. But first, the Maybach has to be safely maneuvered on board. No easy job for the ground crew. The car is close to six and a half meters long, but the cargo hold only six meters wide. When the Maybach comes aboard, two-thirds of it will be inside, the other third outside. So grip the belt as the car leaves the ramp and we'll rotate it slowly into the hold, without the rollers. It's gentle that way. So, wait a minute. Hold your fist, please. So, come. Yeah. The luxury limousine with its pallet weighs more than two tons. The slightest bump or scratch could cost the earth. It would be fatal. The Maybach is priced at more than half a million euros. The ramp agents have to be cautious yet work quickly at the same time since a total of 80 tons has to be unloaded in the next hour. Medicines from France, textiles from India, steel frames from Sweden and car parts from Opel, all destined for the USA. Captain Sergio De Witt and First Officer Thomas Strickner are just back from the flight briefing. They'll be piloting the MD-11 only to Chicago and will be relieved there by a new crew. Air freighting cargo around the world requires meticulous organization by Lufthansa Cargo. To allow the aircraft to take off thrice weekly from Frankfurt, the cargo carrier has to distribute crew members around the globe. Strickner and De Witt will be away from Frankfurt for 15 days before they return. 10.07 p.m. local time. Meantime, pallets take up every inch of space inside the hold. The freighter is fully booked and ready for takeoff. Its first destination, Chicago, on a flight of 4,300 miles. Parking brake is on. Ready for pushback. Pushing back. Engine three. Start. 10.15 p.m. Takeoff is a dangerous time, since the 90 tons plus on board are the equivalent of more than 900 passengers. Should takeoff be aborted, the reverse thrust would generate an immense force and possibly wrench some of the pallets from their anchorage. The pilots, incidentally, are unaware of the type of goods they have on board. They are informed only if shipments are particularly dangerous. Auf der Beladeposition. Fox Romeo. At loading position, Fox Romeo, there's a flammable vehicle. That's our Maybach. Yeah, you can see here. Also a dangerous consignment? Yes, even a car is classed as a dangerous shipment. The reason is a small amount of gas in its tank. That's the only way it can be driven off its pallet on arrival in Chicago. The MD-11 is now controlled by the autopilot, giving Captain De Witt a break for other things than flying. Yeah, it's about time to make coffee. Stewardesses? There aren't any on a cargo flight. The pilot's on his own in the galley. Coffee? You do it yourselves? We make it ourselves. On a freighter, we do everything except clean the aircraft. Otherwise, we look after ourselves. Six hours flying. We're chasing the sun. But the captain has eyes only for his plane. As a pilot, you have a special relationship with your aircraft. And... There's no time for sentiment, though. Air traffic control radios the approach coordinates for Chicago. Just 20 minutes to go before landing. In the cockpit, the tension rises. Landing with a full payload is not without risk, either. Because of its immense weight, the freighter has to be flown at full speed until touchdown, 180 miles per hour. Otherwise, it would descend too quickly. The pilot now has to hit the runway accurately on the touchdown point. If he misses it, he has to abort the landing, climb, and try again, since the MD-11 needs almost one and a half miles to break to a halt, practically the entire runway. For the pilots, it's simply routine. They land safely on time, 25 minutes past midnight, local time Chicago. Captain De Witt and his colleagues have time off. What are you planning to do in Chicago? Sleep. A very long sleep in. 
In two hours' time, the freighter is scheduled to leave, and by then, almost all the cargo has to be offloaded. Every minute on the ground is costly. The aircraft only earns money in the air. But first, an admiring view of the Maybach. A rare sight for the cargo people here, and into the bargain, the chauffeur-driven stretch version. Captain De Witt and his co-pilot have two days off. A new crew will take over in the cockpit. A cool bunch, the Americans. Ramp agent Denon Suds does it his way, casually turning half a million euros with his foot. No bother, the American way. In Frankfurt, they handled the car with kid gloves. 1.33 a.m., the new crew, Captain Schmidt and co-pilot Harry Bauer, are taking over the LH-8400 on the next leg to Honolulu. Topping the agenda at the flight briefing is the weather. Shortly before we landed, Chicago was hit by a heavy thunderstorm, forcing a number of aircraft into detours. Looks as though it's going to be quite calm. We had a cold front with thunder and heavy rainfall here this afternoon, but that's moved on. It's all changed now. Going by these maps and our ongoing information, there are no surprises in store. Nice weather. Over-optimistic? Let's see. There are still nine hours ahead on the flight to Honolulu. Okay, starting the ground crew has done a good job, offloading car parts, medicines, and textiles. Fresh cargo bound for New Zealand is all on board. On this leg, Lufthansa is leasing the cargo hold to its airline partner, Air New Zealand. Three in the early hours of the morning, LH-8400 takes off punctually for Honolulu. Only a few minutes into the flight, the aircraft is buffeted by hefty winds, making it uncomfortable on board. Weather-wise, looks like a mixed bag on today's flight, at least up to the Rocky Mountains. Going by the radar screen, we've got some entertainment lying ahead. The weathermen got it totally wrong this time. A violent storm front is brewing right across our flight path. Captain Schmidt takes it in his stride. Could the storm hit our plane head on? Theoretically, it could. It's a possibility, but then we detour to avoid it. Flying into that kind of storm is not advisable. The storm front is spreading increasingly and blocking our flight path. There's no way through. The two pilots inform American air traffic control and we're given a new route. Change of course? Yes, we've been given a direct go-ahead because air traffic over the states is relatively quiet. We've been cleared to fly direct to California. That's two hours flight straight ahead all the way. The storm's over, but other problems have cropped up on board. Pilot Harry Bauer has a go at plumbing. The toilet is no longer flushing, and there are still eight hours to go to Honolulu. What's the problem? Motor's okay, but there's no water. What now? But Captain Schmidt has a makeshift answer. It's not the first time the toilet has rebelled. An old housewife remedy. Just take a bag of ground coffee, put it in the lavatory, and all these nasty toilet odors miraculously disappear into a wonderful atmosphere. Coffee, the next best thing to a deodorant. The flushing system is still on strike. So with that as a preventative, at least we won't have any trouble for a while. San Francisco shows up beneath us, but not always as clearly as this, the pilot tells us. The last bit of mainland as well. From now on, it's eight hours over water. Time enough to put together a tasty menu. Captain Schmidt takes over as chef in the aircraft galley. Hot air ovens and fridges. The two pilots may never eat the same dish, just in case, to save both eventually being out of action at the same time. This morning, there's a choice between prawns or ravioli. Fish and noodles for breakfast? No, it's breakfast local time, but for us, it's shortly before 5 German time. Considering we ate at 5 local time in Chicago, this is really our dinner, so it's entirely normal. That's his explanation. We're still puzzled by it. But the meal is tasty all the same. Outside, after more than 16 hours of flying in the dark, daylight finally dawns, and the first sight of land after eight hours over water. On the approach to Honolulu, since leaving Frankfurt, the LH-8400 has already logged 8,000 miles. 
Thanks to a tailwind, touchdown is 15 minutes earlier than planned. It's now 20 past 6 a.m. Captain Schmidt informs the ground crew by the by that the toilet won't work. Then it's two days off for him and his co-pilot resting in Hawaii. Honolulu, just a refueling stop and another crew change. This time, Jürgen Horlacher and Martin Baumann are taking over for the next stage to Auckland, New Zealand. 3,500 miles, flight time nine hours. The most interesting leg lies ahead of us, the pilots say. Crossing the equator, the international dateline, and fantastic views, weather permitting. In New Zealand, a special type of freight is awaiting our arrival. Fifty miles north of Auckland, the headquarters of one of New Zealand's biggest horse transport companies. Helen Kroski has just collected back in the day from his stable. The three-year-old thoroughbred is to fly on the LH8400 to Melbourne. Helen's firm transports 6,000 horses yearly. Before takeoff, they have a chance to rest and relax in the stable. How long? It sort of depends. Sometimes they can be here a couple of days, or it depends where they come from. Um, depends when the plane's going out, but usually, usually not too long. Yeah, a couple of days at most. You get the good and the bad ones. You love some, and you, you know, you get nasty with some of them. But yeah, it's quiet. It's good. Do you love horses from from uh, from unbeginning? Love horses, love tracks. <laughs> 24-year-old Helen has been working here for only three months, an experienced traveler. Before this job, she drove tank trucks back and forth across New Zealand. Just three hours to go, then Helen has to be at the airport. It's 4 p.m. Sunday afternoon in Auckland. In our aircraft, though, it's still 4 p.m. on Saturday. But the LH8400 will shortly cross the international dateline, turning Saturday into Sunday. Pilot Martin Baumann is delighted with the South Sea atolls. Formerly with Swiss Air, he joined Lufthansa Cargo in January, his first round-the-world flight. I get a kick out of sitting in an aircraft. It's always a thrilling experience. I touch down with me at the controls in a place I've never been before. Then I get outside of the cockpit, and I'm, I'm glad to get out. And I'm glad I have a chance to learn a little more about the country in the two days that we have in New Zealand. There is the fascination of flying combined with the fascination of traveling. So with the two together, uh, what more could you want? Well, after the hundredth time, you do lose some of the excitement. Hardly surprising, his third circumnavigation this year. And what does his wife say? She's not so enthusiastic, unless she comes along and flies with us. But since we have a child at school, it's only possible during the holidays. Of course, it's always nicer to have the family along. 5.30 p.m. local time. We're coming in to land at Auckland. Back in the day is meantime accommodated in a horse box with two other long distance travelers. More and more horses are arriving at the animal station at the airport. Seven of them will soon be flying with Lufthansa cargo to Melbourne. They'll be accompanied by Rocky Charles Haddon, an experienced groom with 20 years of experience in handling highly strung thoroughbreds four times a week. Horses have no problem flying, he tells us. Basically, it's just like a normal truck ride for them, and most of them have been trucked at some stage. So um, while some do get more nervous and sometimes more claustrophobic than others, they, um, I, these guys will be OK. But uh, sometimes they do get nervous, yeah. As we learned a few minutes later, one of the horses is nervous and has to be treated. I just tranquilized one horse. Yeah. It's too That's sedative. Coincidentally, it's back in the day. The horses are ready to board the aircraft, but another problem has to be handled first. The doors must remain closed until everything has been disinfected. The New Zealanders are terrified of bacteria and germs and want none of them in the country. Every nook and cranny in the aircraft is sprayed until the very last germ has given up the ghost. Outside, the horses are waiting. Still another half an hour before things get moving. But Rocky Charles Haddon is there all the time, keeping his charges calm. Not for one second does the groom let them out of his sight. Then the engines of the LH8400 start up. Our next destination is Melbourne, Australia. How will back in the day react on takeoff? It's his first flight. 
We're not allowed in the cargo hold at takeoff, but we have a special camera there to observe his response. He feels the thrust, but stays quiet. Rocky and another groom wait outside the hold. Only when the pilot turns off the seatbelt sign may the two men get to work. Oxygen cylinders are necessary for survival should the air pressure drop, but there'd be no hope then for the seven horses. Rocky first checks back in the day to see whether the sedative is worn off or not and that takeoff has not harmed the horse. Horses have been known to fall over in their box, he tells us, but he was worried for another reason. He looked very likely that he was going to jump over the front. He was a very nervous horse and... Uh, but in the truck, he was very calm. Yeah, very calm, but obviously he's probably been in a van before. He hasn't been in a, in a box like this before that, that rattles a lot. It's all obviously all aluminium, all steel. And uh, these particular boxes are made to break down. So uh, there's a lot of hinges and a lot of moving parts that rattle a lot on the road. So that's, that, that's what upsets him. Since takeoff in Auckland, close to three hours have passed. It's dark as we arrive in Melbourne, 10,000 miles from Frankfurt. Half time. Offloading the cargo was handled by Air New Zealand, which had also leased the cargo hold of the LH8400 on the flight to Australia. While the Lufthansa crew were taken to their hotel, Rocky Charles Haddon and his fellow groom stay behind to help, back in the day, out of his traveling box. The racehorse from Auckland is still nervous, and no wonder after three hours in a truck on the road to the airport and a further three in the aircraft. But a checkup by the vet shows that the horse is none the worse and feeling well. The new owner is happy to hear it. Today is his first glimpse of back in the day in the flesh. It was recommended to me, and I watched some video um, replays and um, I'm hoping he races very well. Kamal, you're happy to see him? Yeah, well, I hope he's happy to see me. <laughs> Merv Butterworth is an old hand with racehorses. Back in the day, is the 12th racehorse in his stable. He knows what he's doing, say the people at the airport. He has an eye for new talent. Back in the day, promises to be another winner. How much did you pay? 28,000. Hopefully another bargain. Another day over for the groom, Rocky Charles Haddon. Um, that's it, we go to the hotel now and fly back home in the morning. Have a beer. <laughs> Meanwhile, our MD-11 is readying for the next leg on the round the world trip to Asia. We meet Captain Christoph Buchega on a routine ground check. To the rear, two pallets of meat. All that's taken aboard here is additional business. Even if the freighter flew empty to Penang, there'd be little complaint. Because in Penang, the cargo hold will be filled up again, and freight there simply brings Lufthansa cargo more money than here. The plane will be full again in Malaysia, our next destination. The route there lies over Bali, Kuala Lumpur, and Singapore. From here on in, the flight has a new code number. LH8400 becomes LH8401. All Lufthansa flights into Germany have an uneven number. Below 8,000 feet, there is severe turbulence triggered by near gale force winds. But we're fairly light and we can just swoop through there. Now you can see what an MD-11 can do when it's light. With only 17 tons of cargo in the hold, the freighter is 80 tons lighter than maximum takeoff load. Only halfway on the route, Captain Bochega pulls the MD-11 upwards. As predicted, we feel almost no turbulence. But the strong wind suddenly stops. 
and another unexpected problem crops up. We're flying much too fast and nearing the speed of sound. The computer sounds the alert. Over speed. Over speed. Captain Buchheger has to take immediate action since the automatic pilot has failed to react. Such stress situations are rare. The autopilot normally works very reliably. Seven hours have passed since takeoff. Ahead of us, the runway at Penang Airport comes into view. The lighting comes on at the very last minute. Take a look at that. They only just switched on the lights. <laughs> Malaysia. It's 3 o'clock in the early morning. Humidity 87% drives wafts of mist into the hold. The ground crew have a job in their hands, working against the clock. Three hours to load almost 60 tons. This is our Sony shipment to Barcelona. And uh, here also one of the Sony shipment to Toronto. And this is our shipment, our Intel shipment, regular Intel shipment to Amsterdam. Lufthansa cargo's Dixon Wong Chong Hao is in his element, never missing a trick. Walkie talkies for Frankfurt, computer chips for Holland, CD writers for Spain. Oh yes, and the shipment for Hewlett Packard. Even live fish, a specialty from Penang, packaged watertight, not the easiest of cargo. This, this type of fish is very, very sensitive. They easily, if you not handle it very nice, don't take it, take care of it, it's easily to die. Shortly after six, our MD-11 is ready for the onward flight to Pakistan. The day there has already begun. Lahore, near the Indian border, a thriving industrial center. The city has become a key market for Lufthansa cargo. The capacity of the MD-11 freighter is not big enough to transport the many products made here to Germany. Soccer balls are one example. More than 95% of the world demand is served from Pakistan. The German Football Federation has its supplies produced here. Right next door is a factory making surgical instruments. The principal customers are hospitals in Germany. Raw materials are flown in and turned into precision tools, 10 times cheaper than in Germany. These scissors are already expected in Frankfurt tomorrow on board the LH8401. Lufthansa Cargo's man on the spot, Javed Khan, is on his way to the airport. In two hours time, the LH8401 from Malaysia is scheduled to land. As usual, the small cargo terminal is in chaos. As soon as Javid arrives, he's confronted by trouble with a supplier who has delivered more than 50 cartons by truck, not properly tied but stuck together with sellotape. He now wants Lufthansa cargo to fly them to Frankfurt as they are. A heated debate flares up, but there's nothing doing. A consignment like that cannot be taken aboard. If you put one carton on top, on top, on top, and we make a build up uh, of, uh, for the MD-11 pilot, it will go down or tilt or something like this. So we are unable to accept this type of product. The supplier is stunned, but maybe Javed will find a solution. First, though, he's needed in the warehouse, and that's in a muddle as well. A warehouse made in Pakistan. Meantime, the surgical instruments and footballs have arrived. We're amazed that Javed has everything under control. But here in Pakistan, that's perfectly normal, he explains. Up to now, it's always worked out. Somehow. It's now 8 o'clock. The LH8401 has landed and is already loaded with cargo. And Javed has, in fact, found the solution for the incorrectly packaged cartons. They're stored in a small baggage rack, tightly wedged in to do no harm. Unbelievable. In spite of it all, punctually at 10, the MD-11 takes off for the United Arab Emirates, still piloted by the same crew. Pakistan is too insecure for a crew change, says Lufthansa. The pilots will get their first chance to rest at Sharjah, near Dubai. Here, Captain Ralf Hipfer and co-pilot Krizimir Begic will be taking over the LH-8401. At the check-in, the same controls as passengers. Do the authorities fear the pilots could kidnap themselves? The authorities assume that we, too, could be a threat to others. We're presently in the security area, and we're not allowed to carry any weapons at all. Hipfer and Begich are the last of a total of seven crews to fly the freighter on this round-the-world trip. It's now straight back to Frankfurt, after logging more than 22,000 miles in 56 hours. 
A problem occurs shortly after takeoff. The fully laden MD-11 is climbing too slowly to reach its prescribed altitude in time. A tricky situation. The position is critical because it's in the crossing point from the United Arab Emirates to Tehran. And during the Iran-Iraq war, an Airbus was shot down for failing to identify itself in good time. This kind of incident naturally tends to stick in your mind and you do your best to avoid any possible repetition. So what should I tell him now? Not an easy situation for him. The 26-year-old Krizimir Begic is still in training. This is his last flight before his newly acquired skills are put to the test on a check flight. Nevertheless, he feels well prepared for the check after circling the globe. After a time, you naturally understand the high standards that are expected. And knowing that, I'm confident that I'm well prepared for the check. Begic has been with his instructor Hipfer for half a month now. This is the first time he's flown on long haul routes. Two weeks together as a team, hours on end, even during time off. Are there never any clashes? Careful what you say, huh? <laughs> There's really no problem, no. Especially with such a captain. Yeah, you can always avoid each other, but conflicts are really rare. And what does the captain think of this round-the-world flight? Once or twice a year you enjoy it, but more often than that, I'd rather not. It's just too long away from home. Not far from Frankfurt now, right on time, punctual to the minute. But now, just at the finale, after nearly 66 flying hours, there's another snag. A holiday aircraft has had to make an emergency landing in Frankfurt and is blocking both runways. We've now been circling the airport over the Fogelsberg for almost half an hour. Fuel is running short. We have an extra five tons in the tanks. That means we still have 20 tons of air. Any more delay and we'll have to make a detour to Cologne. After a further 15 minutes, we're finally cleared to land at Frankfurt. It's Sunday, shortly before 7 in the evening. We were scheduled to arrive at 5. Up to now, everything had gone according to plan. Of all times, it had to happen on the finishing stretch. After more than 68 hours flying time and more than 25,000 miles, the LH-8401 has touched down at the end of the trip two hours late because of the delay on the very last leg. And that will throw the timetable off track. But Captain Hipful and his colleague have done their job. After 15 days away, they're pleased to be back home. Hello, Mr. Flieger's okay. Wunderbar. And what's the first thing you do when you get home? Meine Freundin küssen. Kiss my girlfriend. In only three hours' time, the same aircraft will be taking off on the next round-the-world flight. Incidentally, Krasimir Begic has passed his check flight with flying colors and will now be aboard the LH-8400 more often on its global travels.